Let's talk about the eigenvalue realization algorithm. The ERA is an output-only system ID method which uses free response data. Impact tests from hammers or drop weights are very suitable for this kind of algorithm. And what I mean by output-only systems is you can imagine you have a bridge that has a number of sensors on it and you're completely clueless about the input force and excitation going into your bridge, but you do have a number of sensors which you can measure the outputs with. So here we have a number of sensors. And these are our outputs. We're going to take the state space system that we discussed in the previous lectures. And this time, we're going to express it in discrete time. That's where we're seeing the k's and the brackets. That's a discrete time. And again, this is a linear time invariant system that is very useful. And so my interest in this lecture is free response and impact testing. And uh, pretty much when you are thinking about input forces and you're thinking about impact testing, uh, the thing that should come to mind is impulse loading. So we have an input force um, that's going to look like an impulse, like shown here. So this is input. And the impulse is taking place at time 0. And it's going to be zeros at all other times. So this is my force or my input. Similarly, my output is going to have a free response um, vibe to it. So it's going to be Y of K. Uh, there's going to be that initial jolt. And then my dynamical system has natural damping, so it will die off. The first thing I want to do is to cut the force section of the response and to only keep the free section of the response. And uh, the cut's going to go here. And what's left of this output is what we generally call the impulse response. Here it is. So the steps necessary for the eigenvalue realization algorithm are going to be as follows. We're going to assemble the data into a Hankel matrix. I'll explain in a second what a Hankel matrix is. We're going to decompose the Hankel matrix via singular value decomposition. Uh, we have to obtain the controllability and observability matrices. And we have to calculate the system realizations. The realizations are the ABCD matrices that we discussed earlier. And lastly, we solve for eigenvalue problems and calculate natural frequencies, damping ratios, and mode shapes. And those are really what we're interested in anytime we're talking about uh, system ID. Okay, so let's put this away, and um, I guess the next thing we should talk about is what an impulse response of a system is, and uh, to pretty much use the uh, system real realizations, which are C, A, and B matrices, and we could uh, express the impulse response as follows for a discrete time system. This is something that's often referred to as a Markov parameter. So if you go to conferences, people say Markov parameter, and you hear it all the time. And this is really what it means. This is a Markov parameter because it's a process where the current step depends on the previous step. So what is the ERA doing? The ERA is the idea of taking our output results, uh, which can be expressed as Y of K, and to realize or to identify the ABCD matrices, uh, these are the system matrices, given that this relationship here holds, given that the impulse response uh, relationship holds. So what I can now do is I can say, all right, for my dynamical system, let's say it's a bridge, I have um, so and so many sensors um, and each one of them is recording its own thing, and um, these sensors are time synchronized, so they start and end at the same time. And uh, what I can say is, um, I'm going to take a cut through this section here, which is a vector of all my sensor results at different time steps. I have Y1, I have Y2, and pretty much I can have up to n many Ys. And that's pretty much the duration of my um, signals. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these uh, sensor results and I'm going to assemble them into a Henkel matrix. 
and Hankel matrix is nothing special. It's just my it's just my sensor results assembled into a matrix format. Uh, so we're gonna call the Hankel matrix in H1. We're gonna put Y1s here, Y2s here, and assemble them up to Yn. For the second row, I'm gonna shift my results one step in time, pretty much one time increment in time, and again, list them again. So we have Y2, Y3, and so forth. And I can do this up to, uh, let's say, um, S many times. So we have S shifts in uh, time increments. <clears throat> and pretty much it's up to you as to how many shifts you want to do. Um, I don't think there's any rules of thumbs for this. Now, this is called the Hankel matrix. What I also want to do is to have a shifted Hankel matrix, which I'm going to call H2. And H2 begins with Y2 as the top left corner um, element. And it's pretty much the first Hankel matrix, but shifted in time by one time increment. Uh, so this is what I'm going to have. And I just have to uh, close the brackets, correct a number of things. Here it is. Um, again, this is uh, the shifted Hankel matrix. And we're going to be working with both of these matrices. Just got to close the brackets, and here it goes. So again, uh, here n is the total number of measurement points and S is the total number of shifts in time. So I'm again gonna write down my discrete time state space formulation. And um, this time what I wanna do is I wanna express my outputs in terms of matrix, real, matrix realizations A, B, and C. So for an impulse loading where U naught is equal to one, what I can say is uh, initial conditions are zero, so X naught is equal to zero. And X1 is gonna equal to AX naught plus B U naught. I know U naught is one and X naught is zero. So uh, what I get here is B. So again, X naught is zero. For X two, I can do the same thing. And um, this is what it's gonna look like. And this is B, this is zero. So what I'll get as the output is A B. For X three, uh, it's going to be the same thing. I'm going to have a squared b, and it's just going to go on. Um, now, let's put this away. Uh, now, what I can also do is I want to um, write my output equations in terms of these ABC matrices. So I have one, y naught is equal to 0, y1 is equal to CB, and uh, so forth. y2 is equal to CAB, and y3 is... Uh, equal to c a squared b. And the only thing that evolves from this point onwards is the exponent on um, the a parameter. Okay, and these things go on forever. Okay, so now what I can do is I can say um, I want to substitute these into my original Hankel matrices and I had two Hangle matrices. I had H1 and H2. So uh, for the case of H1, I'm going to have CB, which is equal to Y1. I'll have CAB, which is equal to Y2. And the rest of this thing goes on. And pay very close attention to the exponents because these are, these are really critical to what we're going to do next. So this is at B. And I'm going to skip through these rows. We're going to have CAS, here it is. Okay, so this is pretty much what my Hankel matrix looks like. And what I can do now is I can say, um, I can break this matrix and uh, convert it to two matrices that are getting multiplied. Um, and you know, if you do the arithmetics, you can see that uh, this matrix multiplication is in fact correct. So this is what it's going to look like, and I have my second matrix, which is B, A, B, A squared B, and so forth. And when these two multiply, I get my original Hankel matrix. Now, these two vectors that I'm showing here have special qualities. Uh, one of them is called the um, observability matrix, and we refer to it as O. It has a lot of 
uh, cool features embedded in it. Um, and the second one's called the controllability matrix. And we call that C. So um, again, uh, for the uh, shifted Henkel matrix, I could express in terms of O and C. So what I get is O, A, C. And A here is my uh, A matrix from my um, state space formulation. What we need to do now is uh, to do singular value decomposition, which was something we all did in our undergraduate curriculums. Um, so you can think of this as uh, having any kind of matrix and breaking it into a bunch of orthogonal and diagonal matrices. So this is what we have. The orthogonal components are the U and the V. Uh, these are orthogonal. And this middle part is the diagonal matrix. And uh, the orthogonal matrices have the qualities where when you multiply them together, you get an identity matrix. So that's a cool feature of these matrices. So we're going to take the first Henkel matrix and uh, do some uh, singular value decomposition. And what we end up with is these four matrices, which we're going to wrap into two brackets. Uh, the first one is going to be called a P matrix. The second will be a Q. Uh, I'm going to use the P and Q matrices on my shifted Henkel matrix. Remember, the shifted Henkel matrix was OAC. So for me to get the A matrix, what I have to do is to uh, invert the O and the C and put them next to the H2. Uh, but since I don't have the O and C, but then the only things I have are the P and the Q, what I can do is I can have an estimate of my A matrix, which is going to look like this. Now, this estimate is going to change based on uh, the uh, length of my data and the number of shifts I have in my Henkel matrix. So this is my, uh, this is my estimated A matrix for my uh, dynamical system. Now, uh, in a similar sense, I can say um, I can have my C matrix, which I get through my uh, P matrix. This is an estimate of my output matrix, C. And... I can use Q to find my B matrix. So again, once I know what B, uh, once what Q looks like, I can have an estimate of what uh, B is. And so this is B estimate. And that's it. I have my A, B, C matrices, and D is assumed to be zero here. And uh, what I'm going to do next is to convert my discrete time system to a continuous time system. So here we had A, B, C. And you can convert those to continuous time, and you can call it whatever you like. I, I put these little things, hats, on top of my discrete time realizations, but, you know, you could do whatever you like. And um, from these ABC matrices, uh, the next thing we could do is to obtain damping, eigenvalues, and mode shapes. And... Um, in the previous lectures, we've gone into the details of how we can get the mode shapes and eigenvalues from these uh, matrices. Uh, but here's a hint. This is what it's going to look like. If I do eigen of A, I get the following. For omega I is my natural frequencies and so forth. All right, let's do uh, an experiment and show how it looks like. So we applied the eigenvalue realization algorithm to this steel bridge, uh, which is called the Mahomet Bridge in Mahomet, Illinois. Uh, this bridge was completed in the uh, 1910s, so it was quite old. It had high levels of corrosion on it, and so it was an interesting bridge to study and to really identify how its behavior has changed over time. The first thing I do is to develop a finite element model of my bridge. And the finite element models are very useful for developing preliminary models of things. And uh, whenever you're doing experimental analysis, uh, you want to find out what your mode shapes look like. And uh, FEMs allow you to get estimates for your mode shapes. And uh, in turn, that allows you to have an idea of where you want to place your uh, sensors and accelerometers. You, for instance, don't want to place your accelerometers in uh, sections of your bridge where there are no motions. And mode shapes allow you to identify those uh, points. We use seven piezoelectric accelerometers throughout the span of the bridge. Because this is a symmetric bridge, we chose an unsymmetric layout for the sensor placement locations. 
just to avoid any kind of redundancy issues that may arise uh, where you may not need as many sensors. And uh, some of the data processing, data acquisition numbers are also provided there. If you're gonna be doing any kind of uh, experimental dynamic testing, uh, you can come back and look at these numbers. Here I'm showing the impulse test results for one of my sensors. Uh, again, these sensors are accelerometers and they are synchronized, so I don't have to worry about synchronization issues. And uh, for impulse testing, I uh, chose a 15 pound hammer and we just hammered the bridge and uh, you're seeing five impulses in this instance and down below we have the time history results converted to frequency domain and so you're seeing some of the uh, peaks uh, that are expected from any kind of dynamical system and uh, pretty much lastly once i run my eigenvalue realization algorithm my era algorithm I'm able to find my natural frequencies and my mode shapes, along with some other information that I haven't presented here. Uh, what you're seeing up above is the first mode, which is the vertical bending mode, and it has that kind of uh, natural frequency, 6.471 hertz, and the next mode would be the first torsional mode, and it looks as follows. And my next mode shape is my second vertical bending moment, which has a natural frequency of uh, 10.716 hertz, and it's shown here to the right. And really, depending on how many natural frequencies and mode shapes you're interested in, uh, you may want to adjust uh, your data acquisition rates, your sampling rates, and to really test out what kind of results you can get using the ERA algorithm. Again, this is an output-only algorithm, uh, so it doesn't have the same level of accuracy that some of the input-output um, algorithms have uh, some of the other methods we've discussed in previous um, videos uh, but uh, it can give you sufficient results depending on what your interests are and what your objectives are all right see you next time